Good afternoon. Everybody, please find your seats. There's still some up in the front. We're going to get started. Hello. <laughs> um, welcome. Uh, the name of this plenary session is Shifting the Balance to Feed the World We All Want to Live in. Thank you all for coming. Um, again, please fill in some seats if you see them. Um, don't be shy. I don't consider this bunch a shy group. So move up to the front. Um, my name is Liz Birnbaum. I'm the program coordinator for EcoFarm. Thank you all for being here. Uh, you don't need to do that. <laughs> um, so um, I just have a few announcements before we get started. Um, so first of all, um, please make sure, I'm modeling mine, make sure you model your badges all the time. Um, we are going to be checking them, and again, for events that have alcohol, please bring an ID with you on, as well as your badge. You'll be checked for both. Um, so um, everybody received an evaluation with your registration materials. Make sure you fill those out because you have the chance to win a 2014 conference package if you fill it out completely, and you can return it either at the back of Merrill Hall right here or in registration, so please do that. Um, and I have a fun little game to play with everybody. Um, who can tell me, the first one to stand up and shout out the page number of the book signings in the program gets a free t-shirt. No. <laughs> no. I'm looking at it, but you can't see. <laughs> who knows? What did you say? No. There's a five in it. I'll give you that. <laughs> so the 35. Who said it? All right. Come find me for a t-shirt. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. So um, I have a couple notes about the book signings, though. That's why I'm drawing your attention to it. Um, we have some changes. You can see tomorrow we had Sandor Katz signing his book at 3 p.m. He's still signing at 3 p.m., but now it's in the back of this room, Merrill Hall, um, after his Art of Fermentation session. So um, if you're not going to that session for some reason and still want to meet him and get your book signed, please arrive about five minutes before 3 tomorrow. Um, Winona Hodder, who will be speaking in this session, is also um, doing a book signing tomorrow at 1 p.m. in the exhibitor tent. Um, all the other book signings are as is. So a couple more announcements. Um, if you haven't bought meal passes yet, most of you probably have, but if you haven't, um, do check registration for availability. They can sell you meals um, sort of on a one-off basis, which I think is wonderful. The meals are a huge highlight of what we do here, so we hope you come and enjoy them. Um, also, um, if you're if you're not lodging at Asilomar, um, there's two things to know. Um, please don't park on the grounds. Please park on the nearby streets. Um, and also Wi-Fi is available in the social hall, um, Phoebe Hurst social hall. And so go up there and you can ask for the password and they'll provide it for you. And if you want to be web enabled, like our wonderful conference website, um, then please um, check everything out. And we're doing tweets. Um, and, and we have MP3 sales available right after the conference. Um, the final thing I just want to note is that tomorrow we have a scavenger hunt in the Exhibitor Marketplace sponsored by Mountain Feed and Farm Supply. So um, you can also win t-shirts and things then. So the drawing will be at 4 p.m. Thank you all very much. Here's Ken Dickerson, our Executive Director. Hi, so these um, folks have a lot to present to us, so I'm just going to do a brief introduction of both of them. We're going to see a one-minute clip of what Winona Howder has been up to for the last year, and then we're going to welcome them both in, um, to the stage so that they can do their presentations. So I'm going to introduce them in the reverse order that they're appearing. Uh, Jim Riddle was raised on a small dairy and produce farm near Colfax, Iowa. He spent his summers as youth baling hay, detasseling corn, and picking beans before attending and graduating from Grinnell College with two degrees in biology and political science. <clears throat> he also has an Iowa teaching certificate. He's worked as an Iowa State Senate consultant, a junior high school teacher, an organic farmer, gardener, conservation district supervisor, organic inspector, author, and organizer. And he was also <clears throat> the Organic Consumers Association candidate for the USDA Chief, the Secretary of Agriculture. 
Winona is the ED of Food and Water Watch. She's worked on energy, food and water, and environmental issues at the national, state, and local level prior to her current work as the director of Food and Water Watch. She, prior to this, she worked um, as a director of Public Citizens, uh, Citizen Energy and Environmental Program. Uh, she earned her MS in Applied uh, Anthropology from the University of Maryland. Uh, she owns a, a working farm in Plains, Virginia, and she's going to be speaking to us um, from ideas and thoughts covered in her new book, Foodopoly. So now we'll watch the clip and um, welcome them to the stage. I am so thrilled to be here in California where so many people care about food. And I have to tell you, I'm really glad not to be home this week. Two days ago, it was 11 degrees, and our pipes froze on the farm. And then it snowed last night. So I'm kind of lucky to be here uh, on the Monterey Coast. So I grew up on a farm and grew up plucking chickens and chopping wood and all of the things that you do when you live on a working farm. And I'm really excited by the good food movement. But in my work at Food and Water Watch, I've really seen firsthand about why we need to build the political power to really change the structure of our food system. So I want to start with a little bit of an experiment. I know some of you have been over there in the hall drinking beer. Um, would everybody just stand up and, and be part of this experiment? Stand up. We... So I want you to sit down if you've ever eaten one of these foods. And I know I would be sitting down if I wasn't giving this speech. Pepsi, Gatorade, Tropicana, Lipton Tea, Sierra Mist, Muggs Root Beer, Amp Energy, Sobe Drinks, Naked Juice, Captain Crunch, Quaker Cereal, Aunt Jemima's Pancakes, Puffed Wheat, rice a Lay's Potato Chips, Sun Chips, Cheetos, Tostitas, Cracker Jacks, Hickory Sticks, Doritas, or Ruffles. Now the reason, oh, we have a hero. <laughs> Now what the, <laughs> oh and over here too, that's great. Now what most consumers don't know is that all of those brands are owned by Pepsi, the number one food company in the country and we are being generous to call Pepsi a food company. They had $64 billion in sales and $6.4 billion in profits in 2011. And what most consumers don't realize when they enter the grocery store is that there are about 20 companies that control what Americans eat, and it looks like there are a lot of brands, but these are the companies that actually control and own those brands, and they benefit from our commodity system. So I'm going to be a bit of a contrarian today and make the case that we need to look a lot more deeply at the food system than just talking about subsidies. And we need to not look at just reducing subsidies as the only thing that we want to do with the farm bill, or the main thing, the main bad thing that we want to take away the, uh, the farm bill. Because unfortunately, the dysfunctional food system, as all of you know, existed long before the 17-year-old subsidy system today. 
And unfortunately, small and mid-sized farms are now dependent on those government payments to actually survive. So as my mother always said, let's not throw out the baby before with the bathwater. Now, I'm not going to defend the subsidy system because obviously it's really bad public policy. But it's, subsidies are a band-aid that cover up the fact that the biggest food companies don't pay for the cost of producing crops that they need for their business. And so that's one of the first things that we need to change. I'm going to ask you to bear with me as I talk about some farm policy history and some statistics because both liberals and the right wing base their criticism of subsidies uh, on the analysis of USDA statistics. And you probably remember that saying that Mark Twain popularized, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Well, it's the truth, and especially with the USDA's number on farms. They claim that we have 2.2 million farms left in this country, an enormous exaggeration. And they're probably embarrassed by how few farms there are that left in this nation and what a bad job that they've been doing. So a close look at the USDA numbers shows that a third of the 2.2 million farmers counted as farms, or the entities counted as farms, have sales of under $1,000. And almost two-thirds have sales of under $10,000 a year. And these are the small businesses, like my neighbor down the road, who has a small hobby vineyard, or my good friend who has a part-time summer business growing and selling flowers to local restaurants. These are people who don't really consider themselves farmers, and in this case, they're actually retired people with very significant off-farm income. Counting these small ventures as farms actually skews the statistics on the number of farms in the U.S., and it makes it appear that only a small percentage of farmers actually receive these subsidies. Now, what's sad is we actually only have under one million full-time farmers in this country, people who actually consider farming their business and do it full-time and use their own labor on the farm. And 82% of these farmers, small, medium, and of course the large ones, receive these subsidies. And of course the largest ones sell or receive the largest amount of the money. But this critique shouldn't overshadow the fact that small and mid-sized farms are actually suffering and that they rely on these government programs, unfortunately, as a safety net. So after accounting for all of the costs of farming, small and medium farms netted just over $19,000. Government payments made up nearly half of that amount. Earnings from off-farm in off-farm jobs made up the rest of the household's income. And the income of those full-time farmers is 19% below the U.S. average. And one of the main reasons that farmers can't make a living is because we don't have a fair market. And this means that farmers may pay more for everything from fuel, seeds, fertilizer, and equipment. And seeds, as all of you know, are a really good example of how consolidation is affecting farmers. The price of seeds, and not just genetically engineered seeds, has skyrocketed. Since the economic crisis, corn seeds, seed prices rose 35%. Soybean seeds were up 24%, and the estimate for 2013 is 7 to 10% increase. Farmers also sell into this very concentrated market with just a few firms bidding for their crops and their livestock, and this really drives down the price that farmers receive. Many farmers raise livestock and crops now under these abusive contracts with large agribusinesses. They also have to face all of the droughts and the bad weather that are associated with climate change. And small and mid-sized farms operate on a very slim margin. 
if we take the subsidy program away without changing some of these other things, this is actually going to benefit agribusiness because when these farms go bankrupt or the farmer just gives up and tries to make a li or gives up from uh, farming, what happens? One of the 115,000 very large agribusiness farms gobbles up that land and that farm, and farming becomes far further concentrated. So you may ask, how did we get in this mess? And Really, we have to go back and look at the New Deal. When the government created programs to deal with overproduction, and overproduction has always been the bane of farmers because when you produce too many crops, the prices become volatile and people don't, the farmer doesn't actually make the cost of production. So the New Deal came in to develop programs that would address the problem of farmers individually trying to grow as much as possible to um, take, to make, uh, to squeeze as much money as possible out of their land and out of their equipment. And so in the 1930s, to prevent too many commodities from coming to market, the Roosevelt administration created supply management programs that would control this overproduction problem. One of the, pro one of the programs was a grain reserve. Uh, that was filled when crops were abundant and then released when they were scarce. And there was also a program to take land out of production so that there wouldn't be this overgrowing of crops. Now, at that time, there were many economic interests, like today, that opposed these programs, red-baited them, uh, talked about it being socialistic to have the government involved in agriculture. And these um, economic interests, and we're talking about the grain traders, the banks, the railroads, and many of the manufacturing interests that wanted labor to uh, be reduced on the farms so that young men would move into urban areas and be cheap labor for manufacturing. They believed that substituting capital for farm labor and replacing small farms with large vertically integrated ones uh, was effic efficiency. And this is what they were promoting and lobbying at the USDA. And these programs began to be chipped away actually during the Eisenhower administration, during that period of the red baiting in the, the McCarthy area. And it took, though, 30 years to completely eliminate those New Deal programs that had prevented overproduction and enabled farmers to make a fair living. And this regulatory effort culminated with the Clinton administration. So after the U.S. joined the World Trade Organization, uh, the very controversial 1996 Farm Bill passed. Maybe some of you are old enough to remember that. It was called Freedom to Farm. Very soon, farmers were calling it Freedom to Fail. And what it did is it took away the very last vestiges of the programs that had prevented overproduction, including uh, the grain reserve, and it completely took the government out of commodity markets. It, it completely deregulated commodity markets. So the most immediate result of that legislation was the dramatic increase in production of commodities like corn and soy, and the crop prices plunged. In 1999, the price of corn was 50% below 96 levels, soy was down 41%, and farmers were in major economic crisis. And there was a lot of pressure on Congress to do something because of the number of farms going out of business. So we know we live in a, le a system of legalized bribery. So rather than actually reinstating some of those common sense programs, uh, instead these members of Congress um, started using taxpayer money to subsidize the, uh, the growing of commodities. And this really um, um, benefited these companies that use commodity crops. And by uh, 19, well, by 2002, these subsidy payments were no longer temporary as they started out in 1998, but they actually became 
permanent. And that is the birth of the 17-year-old subsidy system that we hear so much about and that too often farmers are blamed for. Um, and it only does the food industry and the grain traders good when environmentalists and farmers bicker amongst themselves. So that's why it's important to realize the history of subsidies and that we actually need to change the structure of the food system. And when you look at how the, these junk food companies benefited, soft drink companies saved about a billion dollars during the first seven years of the subsidy program. The large meat packers like Tyson, they saved nearly $4 billion on animal feed between 1997 and 2005. And this was the period that industrialized animal operations really increased in the Midwest and that the meat packers became much, much more powerful. And this, um, these deregulatory policies have obviously had the opposite effect on farmers. Uh, let's look at what a farmer gets from the corn that they grow. Farmers receive about four or five cents from the sale of a box of corn flakes, two or three cents from the sale of a full-sized bag of corn chips, and the corn content of a soda nets the farmer just under two cents. 98 cents of each food dollar goes to the food companies that make, market, and sell these products. So it's easy to blame far farmers for the junk food, but let's think about how the typical American eats. 90% of the, of the food budget goes towards buying processed food. And when you get down to the reasons people eat this diet of processed food, it's because these companies have hijacked the American taste bud. These are some of the main companies that are benefiting uh, these, these top 20 companies. We're talking about uh, Kraft, Nestle, PepsiCo, Tyson, Kellogg, General Mills. And when the consumer enters the grocery store, they think they have a lot of diversity. But actually, you have this small cabal of companies that control most of what people eat. They use billions of dollars on slick advertising. And consider that the typical child sees 5, 000, almost 5,000 food ads each year, and that's almost all junk, fo junk food. And then let's think about the grocery industry. The grocery store industry also profits greatly from this dysfunctional system. We have four conglomerates that basically control the, the grocery market. Walmart is, of course, the largest. And in some markets, these four stores control 70 to 90 percent of sales. And not every place is like the Bay Area or California where you actually have some choice in where you shop and what you buy. Most places, this just isn't the case. And on Walmart's tremendous size has more to do with consolidating the food chain than almost any other factor. One out of three grocery dollars in the U.S. goes to Walmart. In 2012, its sales were 40, um, $444 billion, and they made almost $27 billion in profits. The Walmart heirs are worth more than the bottom 40% of Americans. And unfortunately, the same kind of consolidation is rampant in the organics industry. And I think it's an appropriate discussion today uh, as John Mackey um, of Whole Foods is traveling around with his new book. Um, unfortunately, the same kind of consolidation and the same companies uh, control a lot of the organic brands. Of those 20 large companies that I was talking about, 14 of them also dominate the organics industry. They've bought the, the brands that used to be independent, and now um, they control them. And as the industries become more consolidated, the companies have lobbied to weaken the organic standard. And we all know that we want to protect the organic standard. It's not perfect, but it's the best that we have to really uh, ensure what we're eating. 
Uh, and especially people who don't have the opportunity to go down to the local farm or um, to be part of a local CSA or to go to a farmer's market. Many, many, many people in this country are dependent on the organic standard. And these companies have lobbied to use non-organic and synthetic additives in foods labeled organics. They're able to designate synthetic ingredients as non-synthetic. Antibiotics can be used in fruit production, and synthetic additives can be used in organic infant food. And Whole Foods really dominates the retail sale of organics. And over the 20, uh, past 20 years, Whole Foods has acquired all of its national competitors, and that has stifled competition. Part of what Whole Foods sells is ambiance, fitting organic products into the gourmet slot. But it also has increasingly begun to sell conventional foods at Whole Foods stores, the same products that you find down the street if you go to a Kroger or a Safeway. And this creates a kind of a false illusion that these foods are somehow healthier because they were sold at Whole Foods and that someone screened them. John Mackey's new book called Conscious Capitalism is ironic since he's made a career of kind of stifling competition. Whole Foods sources its organic and national, natural products through an arrangement with the largest and most powerful distributor of organic food, United Natural Foods, Inc. Distribution is one of the least transparent aspects of the organics industry. UNFI is publicly traded and it dominates natural and organic foods distribution. It has no national competitor. Workers at UNFI's warehouse were on strike in December and are still in negotiations. The National Labor Relations Board is investigating them for 45 violations of federal labor law. And UNFI has become exceedingly rich over the last five years. They've, their profits have increased 83% and they've had an average profit margin of 18%. I was speaking, doing a book signing in West Virginia, and an organic deli there was providing the snacks. I was chatting with the, the uh, guy who owns it. He says over the past year, his costs because of UNFI have gone up 7%. So this lack of a competitive distribution system has it's driven co-ops and natural food stores especially in other places um, in the country out of business and so we have to ask how have these companies gotten to be so big and it basically happened during the Reagan administration uh, it's one of the lasting legacies his agent, agency appointees did everything they could to eviscerate antitrust law and I, uh, in writing F Foodopoly, I interviewed one of the commissioners who talked about how they came in, slashed budgets, did away with whole departments, and actually narrowed the definition of a monopoly. And since that time, no president, no administration has been willing to take on this competition issue, this lack of competition that we see throughout our economic system, not just in, in food. So even though there's all this rhetoric about competition, the laws have been changed to allow massive concentration through mergers and acquisitions, and it's basically public policy. So I really wrote Foodopoly to raise these issues because I believe we have to have a long-term vision for really bringing change. And we're going to have to break up the Foodopoly if we want all Americans to actually benefit from a healthy food system. And also, our companies are having major impacts across the rest of the world. We can't let the marketplace be controlled by just a few companies. We need to actually fight for the kind of world that we want, and we have to begin articulating that vision to create the political space necessary for achieving it. We have to be willing to talk about these big structural issues that have to be tackled. That means adding issues like strengthening antitrust enforcement to the good food agenda. 
You know, it's really exciting that across this country, not just in California, there are a lot of people talking about local and delicious food, and people are voting with their fork. We need these same people who are being excited by food to actually vote with their vote and to then hold these people responsible and accountable, whether they're Democrats or Republicans. And the leaders of the good food movement, and that is you, uh, because many of the leaders of the good food movement are here in California, you can play such a positive, incredible role in bringing this issue to light. Because anything that starts in California rolls across the country. And if people start talking about the problems with consolidation and this rotten system that we have today, it will start penetrating the rest of the dialogue, and we can begin to change this paradigm. And there are practical things that we can begin doing too, not just these, the long-term vision. We, must, uh, we can start small. We really need, in this next Congress, to demand an investigation into the state of competition in agricultural markets and the effect on both farmers and consumers. We're going to debate the Farm Bill again. I'm sure you all know the, the fate of the Farm Bill uh, the, from last year. We need to agitate for a competition title. We need to talk about reinstituting some of those common sense programs that have been eliminated, like a grain reserve. I mean, can you imagine we have an oil reserve and we don't have a grain reserve? And we also have the opportunity to really begin challenging the control of the biotech industry. And we saw that happen in California. And we don't just give up now that uh, Prop 37 um, failed. We fight and we take this battle to the legislature and we figure out the most strategic way to go about it. And we see in 15 states across the country, there are really good campaigns to label GMOs. We have an unbroken history in this nation of organizing for social, economic, and political justice. These issues are hard, but history shows that we can come together, we can dramatically change things, we can recreate our food system, and we can win back our democracy. Thanks so much. Food for thought to continue to inspire and inform us in our mission to shift the balance to feed the world we want to live in. And I want to welcome Jim Riddle to um, continue the dialogue. Thank you. Welcome, Jim. Well, thank you, Ken. And uh, thank you, EcoFarm, for inviting me here. It's truly an honor and it's also a pleasure. I live in Minnesota, near Winona, Minnesota, and uh, Winona said it was 11 at her place. It was minus 7 when I left home, and uh, I love winter, but it does start to lose its charm below zero. Um, <laughs> let's see. Well, uh, this is uh, kind of a long title, Shifting the Balance to Feed the World We All Want to Live In. Um, and I'm used to shorter titles, like Why Eat Organic, uh, which uh, la uh, two weeks ago was the Minnesota Organic Conference, which is the only organic conference in the country that I know of that's organized by the State Department of Agriculture there in Minnesota. About 600 people, and we actually go north of the Twin Cities in January uh, for this. Um, but uh, a talk I gave there, Why Eat Organic, I encourage you to uh, search that out on the web. There's various uh, versions, but lots of peer-reviewed summaries of reasons why uh, we are shifting the balance. Uh, but I wanted a shorter title for today, so I look to a source of inspiration, Neil Young, a common uh, uh, habit of mine, and uh, Greendale classic album, if you aren't familiar with it, but the last song on that is Be the Rain. And so I uh, say, Be the Change. And uh, that's my only animated slide, so I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> uh, 
Now, my mother encouraged me to live my values. And she also taught me composting and organic gardening, life lessons. But she said, if you don't live them, they aren't, are they really your values? Your values are what you live, what you do, how you live your lives. They're not some abstract notions out there. They're the reality of our lives. The challenge is to live our lives in concert with our beliefs and not hold our beliefs somewhere outside of our actions. And the other challenge is to shape our lives to learn and teach and live in harmony with nature. Now, to shift the balance and to be that change, we must first control what we can control. Hopefully, at least to some extent, we can control ourselves. So let's start there by balancing ourselves. And I just want to put a plug in here for the Healing Center here at the conference. I spent some time there today preparing for my talk. And uh, I highly encourage you to visit. Not every organic conference has a healing center with uh, massage therapists, but they should. So I want to uh, uh, encourage you to use those services. Um, but in an effort to dismiss ecological food and farming systems, we commonly hear talk about feeding the world. Well, first a dose of reality. Our current agricultural system is not feeding the world. Millions of people are hungry throughout the world. While here in the U.S., many people are simultaneously obese and malnourished. The rates of diet-related diseases Diabetes, heart disease, food allergies, various cancers have skyrocketed in recent years. 30 to 50 percent of all food produced on the planet is wasted due to poor practices in harvest, storage, transport, and market and consumer waste. On top of that, over one-third of the U.S. corn crop is being turned into ethanol to feed our cars. And most of the rest is fed to livestock. So let's talk about feeding ourselves. And this is uh, a scene from where I live, southeast Minnesota, at an intentional community or land co-op, uh, fa famous for our potlucks. So let's look for some advice from the great former Secretary of Agriculture and Vice President under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Henry A. Wallace. During his last visit to USDA, Wallace told the USDA employees, become gardeners. Well, let's raise some food. Even if it's a patio tomato or an herb garden, and this is Joyce there hiding behind the day lilies, or, or, or just regular lilies, actually. Um, but gardening is healthy builds character, puts you in touch with the earth and natural systems. It's a good influence on friends and family, both children and parents. Plus, it helps keep you out of trouble. Now, how many of you raise food? I'm in the right place. Great, thank you, and I hope it helps keep you out of trouble. Well, what else do we control? Hopefully, we control what goes into our mouths. Yeah, and that looked good. In addition to the food we raise ourselves, how we spend our food dollars does have huge impact on the world we live in. And we are making progress. There's been tremendous growth in the number, variety, and location of CSA operations. The USDA reports that over the past three years, there's been a 60% increase in local growers who sell directly to consumers or farmers markets. Business at the Winona Farmers Market, which Joyce and I helped start in the 1980s, is booming with all the products grown or processed within 50 miles of Winona, Minnesota. Farmers markets are springing up throughout the country in urban and rural areas, and this is in Boulder, Colorado. There are also community gardens, school gardens, and farm-to-school programs taking shape throughout the land. 
And I have to say that my uh, EcoFarm massage therapist uh, also works uh, in the uh, Berkeley school system for 15 years uh, running school gardens. And in Berkeley district, every school has a school garden. And she was telling me just the tremendous impact that that has on children and their future. And I just love California. But sales at food co-ops, at least in our area, are booming. They're adding stores, um, doing great. And you do see sales of organic foods at natural food stores and even the big box stores, I hear, I don't go there, but uh, are booming. And it's not a fad, it really is change for good. Besides what we grow and eat, what else can we control? Well, with a little effort, we can control what comes out of our mouths. I'm talking here about food and farming activism. And I'd like to share 10 ideas, many of which Joyce and I have tried and found to be successful. You figure out what feels right for you and run with it. OK. Educate and influence friends and family maybe with a delicious homegrown or homemade meal. Talk about your food and lifestyle choices. It seems simple, but such actions have profound impacts. After all, we are most influenced by the people we know and trust. And I'd like to stop here and introduce you to uh, Margaret and Siri, our new granddaughters, uh, born in uh, mid-November. and. Uh, I uh, just had to slip that in. <laughs> but it reminds me of Graham Nash, teach your children. And just to let you know, Joyce and I are more mo motivated now to continue our work in food and farming activism with this future of these granddaughters now in our lives. So if you're in food or farming business, stand tall. <laughs> Engage in change marketing. I look at the example of Organic Valley, and this where, that's where this was taken. It's a cooperative of over 1,700 organic farmers who are truly changing the world. I like to think of the work they do as milk on a mission. If you're a farmer or food seller, tell your ecological story, how you care for the soil, protect water quality, provide healthy, nutritious food, and prevent children from being poisoned by pesticides and GMOs. Teach workshops. Share your knowledge with field days and tours. I'm sure many of you are here doing just that, and that's one of the things I love about organic ecological conferences is the exchange, the dynamics, and people aren't protecting their proprietary information. They want others to succeed and to learn, and that is just such a wonderful uh, community to be a part of. And got to go on the uh, CCOF tour. This is Phil Foster, Pinnacle Ranch. It was just so great to see the good work being done on the various places we got to visit and to hear about the 40-year history of CCOF. I really enjoyed that. But I also get the chance to visit other conferences, and these are happening all over the country. In the Northeast, the NOFA conferences. Down in the Southeast, the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. And coming up next month, the Moses Conference in La Crosse, Wisconsin, where over 3,000 people will be gathered to share uh, knowledge about organic practices. I also look at the incredible work being done in urban organic agriculture by Will Allen and Growing Power in Milwaukee. It's also happening in Chicago and other places where disempowered people are being empowered to grow healthy food. Sharing your knowledge is powerful and an effective way to help shift the balance. Take direct action. Number four. I want to thank all of you for the work you did last year to increase awareness of genetically engineered foods during Prop 37 campaign. It was a first step, but a huge step. 
And it's my understanding that there are now around 30 states that either have introduced bills or have bills pending to be introduced for mandatory labeling. And we must continue our work to see the labeling of GMOs become law in every state nationwide. So thank you for that. Number five, vote. Most importantly, though, attend candidate forums, talk to the campaign and legislative staffers, and ask hard questions. Let them know what you think. Hold the incumbents and the challengers accountable for making the world a healthier place. Or, number six, run for office. Think about it. Believe it or not, I actually am an elected official. I currently serve as chair of the Winona County Soil and Water Conservation District Board. I call it the small office with the big title. But we do good work to protect soil and water in southeast Minnesota where we have trout streams and just incredible uh, biodiversity. But remember, the world is run by the, those who show up and those who can sit through meetings. <laughs> but there's all kinds of local offices that impact agriculture and food systems from city councils, school boards, county boards, park districts, watersheds, etc. Step up, give it a try. Often they're looking for candidates and we need your voices, our voices at the table. Then there are also appointed positions such as local planning commissions, state advisory boards, commissions, and the NOSB. And uh, this was my class uh, uh, that were appointed together uh, on the last day of the Clinton administration, I must say. But it was really fun to serve with these wonderful people on the NOSB, the National Organic Standards Board. But if you're at all so inclined, I encourage you to step up and either run or seek appointment. Use your electronic devices for good. Help spread the word about ecological food and farming on the internet, Facebook, Twitter, what have you. And in case you don't know, I just want to point out there's now a National Extension Service website devoted so solely to organic production called eorganic.info. I've been on the leadership team the past five years, and we now have hundreds of articles, videos, and archived and live webinars all about organic systems. We even have an organic YouTube channel. Get involved in organic research, either on farm or at an academic institution. Research drives policy and vice versa. And the people who started OFRF understood that long before I did and long before many people. But research is another way to help shift the balance. I just want to let you know about a project that I'm just completing for the Series Trust where I've inventoried all current and, and uh, last 10 years of organic research in the 12 states of the North Central region, which goes from the Dakotas down to Kansas, Missouri, and then all the way Indiana and Ohio and everything in between. And uh, uh, just a few tidbits from that, there's almost 1,500 acres of land at universities in the region now being used for organic research. Every state has at least some in that region. Minnesota even has a 100-cow organic, certified organic dairy herd that sells milk to Organic Valley. Every university in the region is offering organic graduate student programs, and most of, them, most of them have student organic farms. The full report will be out at the end of Feb February, right before the Moses Conference. But my point is, research on organic systems is a powerful strategy to help shift our food and farming to be more ecologically balanced. Number nine, build community both locally and globally. Volunteer at a school garden. Sell or shop at a farmer's market or food co-op. Have a plot at a community garden. Organize neighborhood potlucks. Join home brew clubs. That'd be easy. Uh, or book clubs, discussion groups. Volunteer for a USAID project in organic agriculture. 
These are all great ways to build community and help establish resilient, healthy, balanced, and joy-filled systems. Get involved. People recognize that person? Mark Lipson, a local hero, in a Carhartt coveralls, covered in snow when he visited us in Minnesota. And uh, I just want to say that, keep, remind you, in case you don't know, that we in the organic sector asked to be regulated. We went to the state legislatures. We went to Congress and said, please define the term organic in order to protect it, to have meaning. And it does have meaning compared to natural, for sure. But I said, I've said this before, that when we decided to get in bed with the government, we made a commitment to get up early every day. <laughs> or not go to sleep at all. And it was interesting. I was talking to Mark yesterday, and uh, he was saying that he starts his day still in bed, looking at his device and seeing what ag policy issues he's going to have to deal with. And I am so glad that Mark is in bed with the USDA on our behalf, helping protect organic. Well, depending on your interests and perspectives, I do encourage you to get involved with one of the groups that's active in Washington or Sacramento on food and farming issues. Be at the Center for Food Safety, Food and Water Watch, or one of the other member organizations of the National Organic Coalition. Or maybe you're more drawn to the Ecological Farming Association, CAF, ALBA, CCOF, or Cornucopia Institute, Organic Consumer Association, or the Organic Trade Association. They all have roles to play. The important thing is, get involved, either volunteering, working as an intern, staff person, serve on the board, become a member, but these groups need our involvement, need our engagement, and they're doing really important work. And I just want to say um, that uh, uh, the Farm Bill um, that was reauthorized for the direct payments, all of the organic programs are still technically authorized, but they have no funding whatsoever now. And uh, I encourage you, after this conference, or with your device, to contact your member of Congress, your senators, and your member of, in the House, even if you know they agree with you, contact them and let them know that the organic cost share program, the organic research program, the other organic programs are important to you and funding needs to be restored. And it's important even if they agree with you, they need to hear from you because they sometimes need a little backbone and if you've got their back, they can speak more freely in support of these programs. But this is on the table now and we still can get them uh, reappropriated, but it's going to take our engagement to make that happen. So as we move forward, I encourage you to take a look at the National Organic Action Plan. It was released in 2010 after five years of regional and national meetings of organic community groups. NOAP, as it's called, lays out comprehensive goals and strategies to establish organic as the foundation for food and agriculture production systems across the United States. I also encourage you to become familiar with OFRF's Organic Farming for Health and Prosperity, released August of last year. This report contains extensive review of scientific literature concerning organic farming in the United States and Canada, examines the multitude of benefits that organic systems provide, and identifies the key ways in which agricultural policies in the United States should be changed to support organic agriculture. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, we just need to keep it rolling. Remember, the real food revolution 
is not being directed by politicians or bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., Sacramento, or St. Paul. In fact, as Winona pointed out, it's largely happening despite their efforts. The real food revolution is happening under our feet, in our backyards, in our schoolyards, our neighborhoods, in our kitchens, with the food we eat and how we live our lives. We are truly a movement, a movement with motion. Learn and teach how to live in harmony with nature. In closing, I'd like to say, if you truly want to change the world, you will. And in the process, you'll change yourself. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, uh, thanks to Jim and thanks to Winona. And um, now on with the show. Enjoy the rest of the, the conference. And um, we look forward to hearing from you any thoughts or ideas you have, especially on your evaluation, but at any time at um, eco-farm.org. <laughs>